Okay. Um, uh, so both of these topics sound interesting. I propose that we start with uh, Michael's. Um, uh, it has uh, more direct uh, bearing on uh, Jesse and Sess. Um, uh, but uh, trusted types are certainly important. So let's get to that later. And Michael, would you care to share your screen? Sure, I'll bring that up in just a sec. Um, okay. So just to introduce as I'm figuring out how to do that. Uh, basically, I proposed a while ago that we have a, a standard library for Jesse uh, so that we can write code for Jesse that runs under a non-confined environment as well. Um, and I've made some steps as to what that library could look like. One of the things I'd like to propose for it is Insulate, which is uh, I'll introduce here. So the reason for the standard library is to uh, provide globals in a way that you can import um, without having to modify the the main globals or do anything outside of a module semantics. Um, and here is. Okay. Okay. Um, so what I found in implementing a Jesse interpreter in Jesse is that uh, there are some cases where the Jesse module semantics, because when a value escapes a module, it's supposed to be tamper-proofed, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's through Harden or whatever other mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to write modular code that actually adheres to that. Uh, for the reason that some things that are intuitively separate modules then treat each other as aliens and you can't really pass values between them. Could you give an example? I'll give an example right here. Um, so in the Jessica tree, I have uh, some interpreter, interpreter utilities. So I have a Jesse interpreter, a JSON interpreter, a Justin interpreter, all of which extend one another. And I've abstracted out some utilities that are common to all. Now, the difficulty I have is that I can't write a do eval function that returns a value because it's crossing a module boundary. So it's, its return value has to be hardened or tamper proofed. So in a case where the Jesse interpreter creates a value for a binding, it wants to be able to get write access to that, bind, to that binding's value. And when, when I evaluate it, if I have hardened semantics, I would essentially be hardening every object that I, that I return as a value. So sorry, when you say it wants to get right access, um, um, uh, what, what kind of right, if, if, the right, if the right access is representing in the interpreter, and uh, what would at the base language level be an assignment to a lexical variable, then you can clearly represent that in a way that uh, a hardened object, um, uh, you know, can 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 provide. Um, there, uh, the the hardened is only tamper-proofing the AI the API surface. It's not making the abstractions themselves unable to represent mutability. Absolutely, yeah. So. Uh, what I'm getting to is that, uh, here I'll show you a test case and then this will be a bit clearer. Okay. okay. So uh, may maybe this isn't such a great example. I don't know, but we'll see how it goes. If, if, um, if, 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 if it's easier to create a artificial a uh, tiny example from scratch to make this just just one point. Uh, we can all take a breath while you construct a tiny example that's focused on this point. This is the tiny example right here. Okay. So I'm trying to import. This is a test case that doesn't run right now, and it's basically because I have to introduce a little bit more indirection in my treatment of references. So within the interpreter and in the JavaScript spec, spec there's this major distinction made between references and values. 
And when the interpreter handles a reference, it doesn't have to actually modify that reference. It can just use functions on that reference to do things. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm not sure. The main, the only thing where that I know of, okay, so the, the thing in the JavaScript spec called a reference is quite different than what I normally think of as a reference. Uh, it is the thing that explains the this binding in a method call. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, that, yeah, that is where it's introduced. Um, what I'm finding is that in order to uh, treat state, like in this little function I've highlighted, where the interpreter is going to create an object and then assign to a property of that object, mm -hmm. um, I basically can't use a naive eval to return the value of the object in the second line here. Because if I do that across right. a, mod right. okay. a module right. boundary, then I, I don't have an object that I can mutate. Uh, okay, okay, good, 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 good. So now, uh, now I understand. And, and yes, it's very, it's very specific to eval yeah. if, but, but, but this, this presumes a particular relationship between the meta language and the base language. That's right. Um, uh, so the, the, what I had in mind for the property assignment rules of Jesse um, uh, is that, uh, that they don't, that they can be, that with the static Jesse restrictions that you can only do that to non-aliased variables, essentially something like the Rust ownership rules, um, that, uh, mm -hmm. that this line over here, line 48, uh, could, uh, could be viewed as, let's make a new obj that's like the old obj, except mm -hmm. that the value of its A property is 123, as opposed to whatever the original state of obj was. So Fair. that absence of aliasing, you can treat all of these things as equivalent to uh, deriving new, new hardened objects from old hardened objects. Right. I, I confess I'm completely not following any of this. Okay, Chip, uh, uh, go, go ahead and, and uh, ask questions and get oriented. It's important for all of us to follow this. So, yeah, so... Um, and it may be that this, 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 in fact, is not a good example, but so what's the problem here? So Jesse has static rules for saying that an object that escapes its constructor, or not a constructor exactly, but where it is being prepared, has to be tamper-proofed so that it can't be used as a communications mechanism. Right, so the thing that's, the thing that's uh, hold, hold, no, getting hold, out here hold, is hold, one, two, three. Wait, so wait, wait. Wait, 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 hold on. That, that, was not, that was not the correct statement. Okay. Not so that it cannot be used as communications because a hardened object, an object that's tamper-proof can still provide oh, mutable sure. state. Uh, it's so that, it, uh, so, that, so that it can be defensive mm. uh, and so that um, reasoning about the Jesse, so that, if, so that reasoning about standalone Jesse programs uh, that you can reason about them as uh, as if objects do not have mutable properties. And so I'm I continue to be confused about what's being illustrated here, um, uh, because what gets returned is a number. So what's the issue? <laughs> <laughs> so the issue here is. This bit of code is not just JavaScript code. It's code that's being interpreted by an interpreter that's written in Jesse. Okay. So it's, all I'm pointing out is that it's difficult for Jesse to use objects directly in its interpretation when those objects might cross Jesse module boundaries and have to be tamper-proofed along the way. So in, in this slide here, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, and I, and I think what, what the, the hidden assumption there is that an object, um, the object that's representing obj in the interpreter mm -hmm. uh, is an, uh, that whatever, whatever the interpreter considers to be the property of obj, that uh, it's the same representation that represents the object obj uh, at the, at, you know, um, in, that if it has a property in, uh, in the language being interpreted, that there exists an object in the interpreter that likewise has a property A, uh, and there's no reason for the interpreted and interpreting language to be literally mapped onto each other in that way. The only reason I have for it, and uh, I, I, anyway, uh, th that's an accurate framing of the problem. The, uh, the reason why I do have that direct mapping is because I want to also interact with non-Jesse code that's accessing the objects from the interpreter, for example. Okay. Okay, so you want you want a refractive yes. interpreter. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I would do, so an, a refractive interpreter uh, only has to be refractive at the boundaries where the interpreted code interacts with non-interpreted code. Yeah, precisely. And the um, the the static restriction that I originally had in mind, where things have to be hardened before they escape, uh, uh, they would always be hardened at the boundaries where, uh, re where you might be crossing, crossing a refractive ba boundary between. Um, so let's say that you actually, that we, that we actually, before interpreting the code, rewrote it into the representation that the interpreter is going to act on where line 48 was rewritten into uh, obj equals obj with a, uh, you know, uh, with a replaced by uh, an a with, with 123, however you want to write that. But let's just invent a notation, which is what our interpreter is going to be operating on, uh, where obj is actually replaced in place with a new object that has an A property where there are no, um, there is nothing like a dynamic property update. Mm -hmm. I think we can do that and preserve the original semantics of Jesse. Yeah, uh, um, and that's, I'm, I'm still completely missing the point. Okay. Be, be a gallery you, observation, if I may. Yeah. Um, just a thought here. Um, I think Chip's confusion is coming from a lack of context in the actual code here. Um, what I would suggest, and you could probably go back over the video later, um, would be to write in a fairly large comment block um, illustrating what you're, why you're writing the test this particular way. Sure. Um, and, and, and to, to uh, continue on for just one more moment. Um, your code comments here, you, you don't have a lot of them, obviously. Um, I would say you need to think about what level of understanding of Jesse is, is, is appropriate for the comments that you write. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And let, I me, think let me see, let, let me, let me see if I can directly answer Chip's question. Uh, in line 48, and a, a eval apply style meta interpreter would first meta interpret the expression OBJ, just the variable reference. So the question is, what would the meta interpreter return uh, from the uh, interpretation step where it's interpreting that variable name on that line? Uh, if it is returning an empty object that's already hardened, uh, then uh, the next thing which it needs to interpret, which is the assignment to the property, would 
naively fail. I mean, we would fail unless we do something special because the interpreter itself uh, was already, con we, you know, we uh, had already- uh, 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 So you, 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 you applied eval to merely the expression OBJ. Right. And right. that's the issue. That's the and, issue. And, and that returned because it's, it, because it's, it's, so it returned a hardened version of that, which you now cannot assign the property A to because it's, it's hardened. Yes. Yes. I that's see. Exactly. Okay. Okay. I got it. Okay. I see the problem now. Yep. Yeah. That's the problem. So, uh, Mark, I, I was I was treating the eval as being applied to the entire block, and I was thinking, so what's the what's the issue here? Right, right. So, um, your your solution with doing like a static single assignment kind of thing is one way. Uh, what I came up with and I'm working on now is I can actually use objects as closures, and instead of returning the direct object, return something that I can set its properties with. Okay. And then when it when it actually escapes, and escape is designated by insulate in this case, we can talk about that some other time. But when it actually escapes is when it gets converted into the insulated proper object, as opposed to the one we were manipulating inside the function. But I still don't see how to write the interpreter. Right, I mean, how do you write the eval I mean, the eval is still returning a value. The static rules would pr presumably uh, ins you know, insist that eval wrap insulate around its return. Um, and if yeah. you insulate it by the time the object gets returned, you have the same problem. Well, if you're, this is where the insulate idea helps more than Harden does. Okay. Uh, what insulate provides is a proxy that the that the receiver of an object cannot mutate its properties. Okay. So when it gets returned to the evaluator, though, the evaluator is the one who created it. It's living on one boundary of the insulate, so it can be okay. mutated by the evaluator. Okay. I think we need to take a look at insulate. Sure. Yeah, let's go there. Before, before we before before we switch context, does anybody else um, have questions that are best answered looking at the code we're looking at now? Okay. Let's go ahead. Okay. So uh, this was a probably highly in depth uh, reason for introducing insulate, but it. it it illustrates one of the properties that Insulate has that helps me in this case. Um, so basically, the idea behind Insulate is that we say objects don't pass the barrier between the warm, warm side and the cold side unless they also are insulated somehow. So when I call Insulate on a function and say inside this insulated function is one thing, and outside of it is the other thing. And whenever an object passes the boundary between the inside to the outside, whatever I passed had to also be insulated. Does it pass in either direction? Either direction, yeah. Okay. So it's not quite symmetric in that there is a difference between the warm side coming to the cold side and the cold side going to the warm side. But what it does do is it is a th orthogonal to harden and object dot freeze. So if you freeze an object on one side, you're not really doing anything bad because then that object is frozen for you too. And if you pass it into the insulated function, it's just the same. Okay. Um, but what it does do is it preserves the identity. So uh, when, This is implementation. So we can look at implementation if you want, or do you want to see another example first? Um, do you have any diagrams? Oh, I would love to. <laughs> I'm sorry. I haven't been working on this for a little while, but yeah, I, a diagram would be very useful. Uh, all of them look profoundly sexual, though, so I don't know if they're, they're reasonable. But, uh, the problem is that we're dealing with 
a membrane around a function. And when, when, when values pass out of that function, they get coded in the membrane and go somewhere else. And then when they come back in, they get uncoded. Uh, okay, I got to interrupt here for one second. Um, are, are you saying that cold and warm are your object graphs for your membrane? Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like, like wet and dry, presumably. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing, the cold and warm uh, suggests that uh, it's, it's aligned with the terminology of freezing, where generally the things on the cold side tend to be the things that... Uh, I, I, I get it. it yeah. It's fairly obvious in the naming. The point I was getting at is um, the, same, the same point that I raised about a year ago, Mark, or I'm sorry, a couple of years ago, where if you ever want more object graphs, this is uh, gonna be a bit of a pain point. Actually, no, because this only deals with the one particular interface. So when you wrap insulate around a value or around a function, it defines the boundary right there around that function. So maybe, defines, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, talk. sorry. Maybe I'm talking about a premature optimization here. I'm just thinking, um, about multiple object graphs, and that's my only point. Yeah, and, and here, basically, we're, we're also tracking anything that has ever been insulated, so we're not double isolating. Okay, so this is an, this is an identity preserving membrane. Yeah, precisely. Okay, okay. Um, uh, so, okay, so carry on. Okay, so, um, I make an error here just so I can see where insulate was called in the first place. Uh, and then I have the two weak maps from the, the warm to the cold side and the cold to the warm side. And they are treated equivalently in the sense that we don't want escape from the cold side. And at the same time, we don't want infiltration from the cold side to the warm side. Okay. Um, so we have them in a certain order, we say one side is warm, one side is cold, and those become the in and the out maps. So when we say uh, we're sending out something, then we check to see if it's already been wrapped by us and return it, if it is. Um, and likewise, if it's already been wrapped anywhere, then we don't insulate it again. We assume one, one layer of insulation is enough for anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have enter and leave functions here. So when an inbound object enters us, then we wrap it with the maps saying the inside, inside map is the outside and the outside map is the inside. So we're reversing the order of the mapping <laughs> when it's inbound. Okay. And when it's leaving, then we, then we wrap it in the order that we are in right now. Uh -huh. so that's completely arbitrary. They just have to be opposite. Right, right. Uh, so when we leave, when we have a thunk that's producing a value or throwing something to leave, we either wrap its return value or we wrap the exception that it threw. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, the handler is straightforward. It's basically, we just make sure that our object is essentially read-only. So this is for the proxy that we're returning. Um, one thing that you can't do is harden an insulated object that doesn't want to be hardened. So because of the proxy invariance, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't simply pretend that we hardened it. Uh, all I can do is say, no, sorry, you can't harden it unless it already is hardened. Uh, wait, hold on a second, hold on. Um, the, you're in control of the shadow. The shadow is just a, a something that you create in your membrane mechanism, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the oh, so it need not be the target, is what you're saying. Well, the shadow should cannot be the target in order to have a proper membrane, because if okay. the shadow is the target, uh, then you cannot keep the sides for, uh, uh, separate. Perfect. Okay, that explains a lot. Uh, have you been using the the target as the shadow? I have been. Yes. I see. Um, uh, that must have been very confusing. <laughs> uh, the only thing I found is that well, 
this is still debatable whether this is good behavior or not, is do we want somebody to be able to arbitrarily freeze an object that we pass to them? Is that reasonable to expect? So, so let's talk about that. I mean, I think this is, this is kind of the essential issue. Yeah. Uh, it goes to the heart of what the, what the intended semantics of Jesse are. Um, the, well, well let, okay, so let's start with the assumption that the answer we, that the answer we want is yes. That anyone with access to an to an object uh, can harden it, and that the default behavior or can try to harden it, uh, and um, the default behavior or the behavior in the absence of uh, user code using proxies to avoid being hardened mm -hmm. uh, uh, is that, um, and and if I recall. We did not actually provide proxies themselves in the Jesse whitelist, correct? No, we did not. Okay. This is so, separate, specific to the interpreter and the environment evaluating. Right. So uh, without using proxies, you can't create uh, exotic object behaviors. And non-exotic objects cannot resist being frozen. Right. Or uh, graphs of them cannot resist being hardened. Um, uh, so let's say that the answer to your question is uh, yes, uh, anyone can harden any object they have access to. Okay. And now the issue about whether or not that prevents the creation of an insulating membrane very much depends on what you want the semantics of the insulating membrane to be. Yeah, so the, the semantics that I'm hoping for is that anything that crosses the boundary behaves as if it's already hardened. Okay. But when it comes back, it's yours again, and you can do with it as you please. So do with it as you please. Um, uh, uh, so let's, okay, let's take the example that we were looking at. Uh, Obj.a equals whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, if in the language being interpreted, uh, uh, there was an explicit harden of obj, mm -hmm. then, uh, which presumably in the, in, within the, within your interpreter, that would be a hardening of the proxy for obj rather than a hardening of obj itself. Um, uh, uh, if then the assignment to A resulted in the interpreter modifying obj itself, and then in the language being interpreted, it acted as if obj's, obj had a new property after it, we thought we had hardened it, Mm -hmm. That would be a violation of the hardened semantics in the language being interpreted. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So expandos are explicitly prohibited. Anything that violates the normal object invariance on on freezing, um, where harden implies freezing, uh, should be prohibited. Must be prohibited. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's okay. That's that's easy enough to work with. Uh, what what I was basically heading towards is that when I'm dealing with an object that's being prepared as opposed to uh, delivered, um, whether it's being delivered by being insulated or whether it's being delivered by being hardened, those those functions specifically, like the object that freeze as well, would force the freezing of the object. Okay, so in other words, the, the, the proxy, so let me make sure I understand this. The proxy in the absence of, um, of an explicit request to freeze, the proxy does not create a frozen target. The proxy right. just has an empty, I'm sorry, does not create a frozen shadow. It holds on to the unfrozen target and it 
holds on to an unfrozen shadow, probably an empty shadow. Um, and, uh, um, uh, but the proxy prevent, the proxy, if, if let's say asked is frozen, will say no. But uh, if an attempt is made to mutate or extend the object, the proxy will refuse to do so. So it has all of the defensiveness of a hardened object, except that it does not claim to be hardened. Mm -hmm. And it's more like a read-only view. Okay, okay, good, good. Yeah, that's the what proxy we're is providing a read-only read view rather than a frozen object. Yes. But if you explicitly freeze it, then it will turn the object into a frozen object, no longer a read-only view of possible, possibly mutable state. That's right, yeah. So okay. that semantics can be done by me fixing this paragraph here, where we basically say, if they prevent extensions on it, then we prevent extensions. That's it. Okay, okay, now I understand. This is a read-only view proxy. Yes. Okay. Um, technical comment here. Um, I'm thinking in terms of lines 73 through 78. <laughs> um, if somebody is setting the value to the same value you've already got. Oh, okay. Just a thought. Yeah, that's a good point. Also, uh, how does this interact with getters and stuff? I might have missed something because I came in halfway through the meeting. Uh, so that that actually that's not something we've talked about yet. So that that question is is completely relevant. And a slightly different question: uh, Is there existing examples in the language of writable uh, properties that fail to update? Writable properties that fail to update. Uh, you a can property create a descriptor that has writable true, but it does not change the value. Okay, so uh, so uh, it, 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 you can certainly create a proxy that does that. Uh, uh, in addition, um, uh, there is this very, very weird case uh, that um, of the 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 window proxy object in the browser where this this issue exactly does come up. Uh, uh, the Because the frame may get navigated and the window proxy maintains its identity, uh, it represents all properties as configurable so it's not writable true so much as configurable true, um, but it's, it's, it's in spirit the, a, a case of what you're asking about. Uh, it represents all of its properties as configurable, but uh, the, if, if on the underlying window, the, the unexposed window, the property had been made non-configurable, non-writable, then the window proxy will refuse to update it but we'll still describe the property as configurable so that if the frame is navigated, uh, the window proxy can re report something different for the same property name. If it had reported the property as non-configurable, non-writable data property, then it would not be allowed to report a different property value, a pr different property state once navigated. And I believe Firefox is the only browser that actually correctly implements that semantics. I know the HTML spec has an explicit call out of breaking that semantics for location. <sighs> Why am I not surprised? But I, I don't know if there's any other case of that. Okay. Um, I have not been following what's been happening with location. I've only followed the window proxy thing. Well, assigning to location is kind of like sawing off the limb that you're sitting on. <laughs> True. But still, the, I mean, the problem with allowing any object, any object at all that breaks the object invariance 
is that the mechanism for enforcing the object invariance on a proxy relies on the object invariance already being enforced on the proxy shadow. If there's any object that, that can violate the object invariance, then you can create a proxy that uses the violating op object as its shadow and then use that to create a proxy that in turn violates the object invariance. A uh, couple more points, if I may. Certainly. Yeah, please. Um, line 70, you're also going to have, uh, you, have to, you have to deal with the same value problem there as well. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I know, I know. Um, I, I'm just curious. Yeah. I, I deliberately made it's more restrictive than I knew it had to be. So, yeah. Right. Um, on another note, um, defined property has some special rules when your attributes object here, which is traditionally called a descriptor, um, doesn't have the, uh, it has, has, um, it has special rules for handling enumerable and configurable. When it has only one of, only those properties, in, in other words, it doesn't have a getter, it doesn't have a setter, it doesn't have um, a value or writable. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, actually, I'm, I'm just thinking about whether, I'm just raising it. You probably want to think about whether you want to pass those through or not. Um, also writable. Yeah. Um, let's see. Was there another thought I had? Could I see all the methods for this function? Just, yeah, definitely. Just do a quick code, fo code fold of the others, please. Uh, code, code fold here. So there's 13 traps. So we default is extensible and get on property this subject. Okay, that's five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, apply and construct are the ones that you really want to think be really careful with. Yeah. With apply and construct in particular. With apply and construct in particular, you've got a uh, you've got a problem both ways. You've got to handle in wrapping arguments incoming, and mm -hmm. count and counter wrapping arguments outgoing. And yeah. I just want to make sure you've done that here. I don't know if you have. So I do that with the enter and leave functions. So my my actual application is surrounded by the leave wrapper. Okay. And my this and my arguments are surrounded by the enter wrapper. Okay, I, I just want to double check that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a worry about a possible confused deputy okay. on the enforcement mechanism here. Um, the let's to go back to the obj a example. Okay. So let's say that obj is released from the function being interpreted. Let's say let's let's go you know let's let's just say that you uh, create obj and then you return obj. Uh, and then it's some, um, and then, and then the, uh, I'm sorry, let, let me, let me, well, I'll just, I'll just speak a new example from scratch. Would that be better, better here where I'm saying here's a function make object is insulated that creates an object. Okay. Uh, so make obj. Yes, 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 yes. Good. That's exactly, that's perfect. This is, this is the example I wanted to examine. So, um, so you're insulating the, so, so make obj is a insulating, is a read only view of the underlying empty object. Uh, and then um, uh, the, you're making a, so let's say that, that both of these functions are being interpreted by the same interpreter. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, so now the, on line 57, um, uh, the, the dot A assignment, right? You want the, you're, you're trying to create a situation with the dot A assignment on line 48 would succeed. And 57 would fail. That's right. So I don't understand how it is given the mechanism you described that line 57 fails. 
Okay, so every insulate call generates its own memory. I see. Uh, and that's enforced in the interpreter, as I was saying, by, and this has yet to be written, so I'm kind of hand waving a bit. But uh, in the interpreter, when the actual insulate call returns, or when something crosses that boundary, then in the interpreter will actually insulate that value separately from every other object that's ever insulated. If that makes sense. So then it's insulated both on the meta level and on the, on the interpreted level. Uh, okay, this, so there, so okay, so, so I understand, good. So I understand how this one avoids the confused deputy. Um, now let's let, let's do a modification of this. Um, uh, so why don't you go ahead and copy lines fifty, line fifty three through line sixty one. I, I think there is a missing um, line sixty one. There is a uh, close curly close paren oh, semicolon. That, that's uh, within the test. I'm I'm just. I'm, outdenting the code. So that was outside of the expect to throw. Oh, 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 okay, fine, fine, good, good, good. Um, okay, so now on line 63, uh, I want you to return, um, actually, let's make that function more like uh, the function on line 46, a function with a block body that creates a named object obj. Okay. Uh, at the end, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. Uh, at the end, go ahead and return obj. Um, and then between the two, go ahead and, yeah, you can get rid of the rest of that. Um, between uh, line 64 and 65, Oh, oh, sorry. I want to. Re I want to return two things. So go ahead. Between so between sixty four and sixty five, say um, uh, const fn uh, equals um, uh, open curly. Um, uh, Oh, oh, right, right. Sorry, you got it right. Um, equals um, yeah, that uh, obj dot a equals twenty three. Mm. Okay. Okay, and now at the end, return a pair of obj and fin. Okay. So now the question is, um, uh, uh, since fin is within the same insulate, presumably even after both obj and fin have been returned, fin can be used to modify obj? That's correct, yeah. Okay, that's definitely a violation of Jesse semantics that I have in mind, that I had in mind. Okay. Uh, we can discuss whether we want this instead, uh, but How is this different from changing any other closed over state? Uh, the difference is that that um, in the originally intended Jesse semantics, once the object escapes, uh, its properties were no longer supposed to be mutable. And by doing this read-only view thing, you're not putting a temporal constraint on mutability, you're putting purely a spatial constraint on mutability, mm -hmm. which okay. is, are you going through the read-only view or are you within the insulate? Um, and, you know, this might, I mean, it's, it's worth examining. This is a coherent design. Uh, it's just not the design that I had in mind. Uh, 
I have, in general, thought about this kind of problem in the past um, for ES membrane, where you've got you've got a function that would mutate things on the other side of your ob on your other object graph, really. And you're wondering, do you want to allow? And you're saying, in this case, you didn't imagine that being allowed. <clears throat> um, it just has to be thought about in a little bit more detail. So. Um, this is one of the things where I was going to write a standard distortion to say, no, this object will operate on this side, on this particular object graph instead of the, uh, instead of its origin. And I just haven't gotten there yet in my stuff. So if, if, if you have a read only view as opposed to an immutable object. Right. The implication there as is. A, as, a, as opposed, I'm sorry, I just, I'm just had to be very, very picky about this terminology as opposed to a frozen object, because the object can still contain functions that, ha that, that have closed over state, like assignable lexical variables. So it's not immutable, but its properties are-, on, are, are Okay, f f fair enough. But, but I don't think that affects the fundamental point or question I was thinking right. of, which is if you have the notion of a read-only view, the, the idea of it being read-only as opposed to being frozen or immutable is that the, the visible state that you can see through the read-only view might change between one time when you look at it and a later time, That's but right. not, not, cannot be changed directly by you through that view. Correct. But there might be somebody else, someplace else who can change it. Correct. Include, including this, uh, this FN function. Right, which, exactly. Which, and so what you've done I, is you have exposed the, through the read-only view, you have exposed a function which can modify something that you have the read-only view of. Yes. But that doesn't seem categorically different from something which can modify the state of the thing you have read-only view of that you got through some other pathway. Right. I mean, there's the the this the re, the FN does not make this notion of read-only view incoherent, and it's it's not actually a confused deputy. Right. Um. It's it's an explicit authorization. Yes. Saying because it has to happen inside the same insulate hall. Right. Right. FN was created as a creature in the environment where it had a right to do the modification. Right. And now and you have. Through the read-only view, you you have been given the right to invoke that creature um, explicitly, uh, where the invocation is not an action that the read-only view is supposed to attenuate. So there's not there's no contradiction here. Right, and and so it seems kind of like as with the distinction you were just drawing a moment ago between a frozen object and an immutable object is that in, in the classic concept of a frozen object, there be, may be mutable state, but it's not mutable state that you can see directly, although you can see things that are consequences of that mutation. Mm -hmm. Here, you've got mutable state that you can see directly, mm -hmm. which actually, this strikes me as actually a useful concept. Um, um, which is to which is to which is to selectively expose some of the state to to direct sight, a direct line of sight, um, um, or to rather to expose say all of the state of something to a direct line of sight, but then be able to grant grant selective mutability to some of it, but not other parts of it. Um, and so, from a, a capability kind of mindset, this seems like a very uh, natural and useful concept. And so the question is, should this be allowed? Um, well, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm, I may be unclear on what all of your uh, goals for Jesse are, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but, but in, a, in a broader context, the question, um, should this be allowed? I think the answer is a clear yes. <laughs> Certainly, it is allowed in SES because there's nothing in 
this that can't be implemented in SES. And right. uh, the uh, SES does have proxies, um, you know, does have everything needed to bring this about. Um, uh, so it can't be disallowed. Um, it's at the Jesse level, there's a question about which language is it that is considered to be the subset of SES. Is it the language with the, if the, if the meta interpreter is inserting the insulates in the interpreter, uh, uh, then the language being interpreted with, that does not have explicit call, let, that let's say does not have explicit calls to insulate uh, is nevertheless having an insulate semantics imposed on it. And to what degree does that simply stay within the subsetting rules and to what degree is it doing something outside a language subset? Uh, and this one's tricky because um, the thing that it's the thing that it's obviously changing is that assignments sometimes fail, uh, even though there's nothing in the language being interpreted that looks like it would make those fail. And that's within my notion of a uh, fail stop dynamic subset that as long as nothing causes an exception, that everything that happens would have happened in the same way in the larger language. But the smaller language, the fail stop subset, can reject things with exceptions that would have proceeded to do something non-exceptionally in the larger language. Right. So I, I, I take this that the, the fundamental question is, what do you want? Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I would advocate here that uh, the cost to insulate should be explicit, just as there are with Harden, for the reason that then you can take Jesse code that works in one way and throw it into a regular JavaScript interpreter, and with the right library, it will behave the same. Okay. So, so, uh, so, what would be the static? What static rules do you have in mind for when uh, Jesse requires insulate to be in the source code? Uh, I'll show you from something complex. Okay. Uh, so this is written in Tessie, which is the, the TypeScript superset of Jesse with some other stuff in it. Um, and basically it compiles down to this, where we say the first thing we do is import insulate. And then everything that's a top level definition gets insulated. Okay. Uh, and get and gets now and, and now it becomes very significant that they're being separately insulated as opposed to jointly insulated. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the main rationale for that is if they're being exported individually, which is a possibility, mm -hmm. then they need to have the same insulate semantics even if they're being used individually versus as the default exporter from one of the other exports. So just very concretely, if I say const find equals, uh, you know, insulative stuff, and con then you know semicolon const accept equals insulative stuff, versus I said const open square bracket find comma accept close square bracket equals insulate open square bracket stuff kind comma stuff close square bracket close paren. Uh, in the second case, they would be within one insulate and yeah. could thereby have mutually mutating access to each other. And within your rules, I would still be allowed to write that, but I would have to explicitly write it. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. For the same reason that you could just bundle all this stuff together and export it as default. Right. Right. And right. say my whole module just has one installation. Okay. Okay. 
but also the main reason why it's required on the individual cons, for example, is that uh, the other part of the static rule is that we can't, um, we can't have any module level mutable state except for what's created by a closure. Um, so these things like const find would have to be hardened anyway in our, in our, mod in our uh, other static rules. So, yeah. Okay, but harden would actually freeze the properties themselves. Whereas insulate is binding find to a read only view where within the read only view, there might be some functions that mutate the, uh, that mutate properties of other things within the read only view. So mm -hmm. it seems to me much harder to statically, to figure out what further static rules I need to impose so that uh, find is not just insulated but actually pure. Actually pure. So right. what I'm saying about purity is that from what Dario was explaining a while ago, the fact that find is a function that has no access to top level mutable state or module level mutable state because it can't, it can't even access its own find state, find dot something. It can't access except dot something. It can't access any of these things. That that makes this function pure. Okay. So I so I understand that it can't access things outside of find. What it can't I'm, even access find itself because find is outside of the insulation. Yes. I, yeah. I got that. Yeah. Um, now, what can I write on on the, uh, the insulate open paren stuff close paren? What can I write? inside that stuff? Anything that's not, uh, doesn't cause evaluation. So basically object literals, array literals, okay. function so, literals, and uh, primitives. I cannot write a function, I cannot, write something that would cause a function call to happen. Right. For the, okay. Or an iffy, for example. Or what? An iffy, like immediately oh. evoke function. Okay. Yeah. And therefore I cannot introduce a binding, a variable binding that that's bound I can't both name a value that is part of find uh, and use the named value from something that is also part of find. That's correct. And that's because expressions can't have variable bindings except by introducing functions, which because they can't be called at top level time, at the you know, module initialization time, uh, can't have the variable bindings can't be bound to values that are part of the top level state. Okay. Huh. Um, can I just while we're still ruminating a little bit, uh, zip back over to Insulate implementation because the punchline is left. Okay. So basically, after the construction of the proxy, which we call the insulated value, uh, we added to our weak map saying that it is insulated, so nobody else has to. 
Uh, and oh, this is the part that I wanted to get to. Um, right in here in the apply method. Um, so this is the check that prevents this capture. So we say if this arg is an object and the target of, of this apply is not in the same side as the this arg is, mm. then we just say this arg is undefined and we don't let it. Okay. I see. An enter of undefined is presumably just undefined. Uh, sorry, uh, which? An enter of undefined? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So in the next line, wrapped this in that case would also be undefined. Yes. Okay. Okay, okay, got it. So this means that this means that that okay, so the static rule ensures that there's always an insulate boundary between Jesse and SES. Correct. And therefore SES code that can mention this cannot trick Jesse code into revealing something inappropriate because of a this binding. Yeah. Okay. And the one exception to that is if the this arg that we're being called with already went through the insulation, so they're calling it on an insulated value, then we know they got it some other way. Uh, it's not good enough. No? No. Because the, just because they got it some other way, um, just because one part of the program having gotten it one way uh, doesn't mean it's okay for it to leak that through an abstraction that didn't think it was leaking something mm -hmm. to okay. another part of the program that obtains it. Right. Part of the point of a defensively consistent abstraction is that two clients of the abstraction can, that share the abstraction can only interact with each other according to the, to the semantics of the abstraction. And if they can abuse the abstraction to leak a value from one to the other that was not within the intended semantics of the abstraction to enable the leaking, uh, that would be bad. Okay, I'll, I'll look at them closely. But I think this is your strongest case for, for doing all of this mandatory membraning rather than mandatory hardening. Is the mandatory hardening with, with hardened mechanism plus as many static rules as you like does not by itself create safety against this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Does anybody, uh, does everybody uh, follow the this binding issues? Does anybody have any questions about that? I think I'm still a little fuzzy on the uh, concern that you just articulated. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I kind of have a fingernails grasp on why it's a problem, but I don't see a, a, the actual Failure mode case. I, I'm trying to construct that in my head and, and failing. Okay. 
Right. So the question would be when could a Okay, so first of all, just the just as a, a reminder, the general Jesse versus SES this binding hazard would be let's say that my favorite example is let's say you're writing an observable Jesse. And the observable has a list of listeners and it registers in that list of listeners a function. And then the uh, thing, the event that the listeners are listening for happen so that the, what the observable code does is it just says, uh, you know, for i equals zero to n minus one, um, uh, a list of listeners, uh, open square bracket i, close square bracket, open paren, notification arguments, close paren. So it just loops through the array invoking each of the listeners, which is just a function, invoking them to notify. Now, if the listeners themselves are all written in Jesse, there's no problem because all they get are the arguments. If the, if the, if the listener is written in SES, then it can be a function that mentions this. And the syntax um, array, open square bracket, I, close square bracket, open paren, args, close paren, uh, will provide the array itself as a this binding to the, thank you, um, as a this binding to the invoked function. Uh, so, right, so what, what Michael just wrote on line 126, if the, if the function looked up is written in SES, uh, it can capture the array. Yes, I think I... I, yes, the fact that 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 uh, or yes, the array. The, this very case was one of those. Um, oh crap! I didn't realize it worked that way. Of course, it works that way. Realizations I had fairly recently. Um, so yeah. Right. So with Michael's insulate rules, uh, they would ha there would have to be a insulate that explicitly appears in the Jesse code and it was therefore part of the semantics of the Jesse code whether you consider it to be a Jesse program or an SES program in both cases the insulate call explicitly appears in the source and therefore it's part of the, the, the membrane that gets put in place is can 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 impose changes that are not equivalent to the membrane not being there and are not a subset or something other than a subset of what would happen with the membrane not being there, such as replacing the this value in the membrane crossing invocation with undefined. So, so could you um, replace line 130 instead of saying this arg equals undefined, you say this arg equals uh, insulate this arg. It would still be captured. And uh, yeah, Mark and I did talk about this earlier in the, in the discussion around what this capture is, means. And uh, my understanding is that's not sufficient. It would still be captured even if it was a read-only argument. That's right. I do. I do not want the Jesse code. Ah, uh, 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 right. Because you can still see it. So, for example, in that array example, you'd be able to go look at the other elements of the array. Exactly. Which and call the other callbacks. Got it. Got it. No, that's, yeah. that's that. That makes total sense. Right. You could even call them back with other arguments, uh, falsely notifying them of things that did not happen. Right. Right. No, that would be terrible. Um, um, I was thinking that the is issue was mutation, but the issue is not mutation. The issue is exposure of uh, information which you did not intend to expose. Yep. Okay. So I'll have a look at it. But I think 127 is the only problematic line in that regard. Saying that if we're already exporting, then continue.
So it's fine to say it's not exported and it's not from outside, so make it undefined. Or it is exported, but it's not from outside. Target is exported, but the... Oh, 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 oh. It took me a while to parse it. Line 127 is part of the extended conditional. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, the fact that the normal pretty printing rules end up with 127 and 130 being at the same level of indentation is quite unfortunate. <laughs> That's why my formatting rules are different. <laughs> it's a great thing about conventions. Oh, right. If you were using two space indentation, but lining up the conditions with the open paren, that would actually fix this particular case. Uh, let's, let's, yeah, I'm sorry. I should not have brought up an indentation. Um, okay. Right. If you got rid of 127, then there would be no indirect this capture issue either. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I will test that. I will try that and see how it works. Okay. So the thing that is surprising to me about this language and the thing that might exceed the character that I wanted for Jesse is that in this language, uh, reasoning about programs definitely includes reasoning about property assignment happening dynamically to aliased objects. Yeah, that has different static properties than what I was reading earlier. That the different static properties than what you were reading earlier, where? When I first looked at, at Jesse, it looked like you could sort of tell what the static properties are of things are once you call a function, mostly. Okay, yes, good. Now, of course, one could do both. We could um, impose stricter static constraints so that we still have, we still prevent dynamic alias property assignment while also using a membrane mechanism like this to prevent this capture. Um, but then if we want to allow the static, um, well, no, that's, that's, I mean, it's a, it's a smaller and more disciplined language. Uh, if it doesn't, if the static rules don't make the sources look unpleasantly more verbose or, or, or harder to read, um, I still don't see a good motivation starting from Jesse for wanting to introduce uh, dynamic property assignment to alias objects. Um, Jesse had some control over aliasing somehow. Remind me about that. So uh, in the original Jesse, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm calling it a spec, but I want to be very clear that it was an aspirational spec. As I, as I wrote down, I didn't write down actual static checking rules. I wrote down the goals that the static checking rules should bring about. Um, uh, but the idea was that something like the... Um, uh, the Rust static ownership rules or, or linear variable rules or something mm. um, uh, be part of the static analysis so that um, on, on line 48, 
that uh, that that assignment to uh, A would only be allowed in the original Jesse uh, if it was known that obj is unaliased, that the value that obj that that obj holds, that, that the value of that variable is unaliased at that point, um, uh, so that you could con consider it equivalent to a line that replaces obj with a brand new object that's just like the original, except that it has an A property with value 123. Um, and and uh, the meta interpretation dilemma that Michael was raising, uh, my suggestion was that one way to deal with that without um, moving insulate into the interpreter uh, in a problematic way, is to first rewrite that into uh, such modification code um, uh, before passing it to the meta interpreter. So basically, the meta interpreter is meta interpreting a language that in which the notation of property assignment no longer appears. Right, and then followed by obj equals obj prime. Mm, okay. Exactly. Um, uh, so, and good, thank you for reminding me that we already have a notation for expressing uh, property replacement fairly compactly. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, that was sort of my sense is that I wanted the commented out code and the non-commented out code on line 48 in Jesse to be equivalent to each other. And then um, the non-commented out code would just be both a more compact notation and one that uh, one would normally expect to be uh, to be executed more efficiently than the commented out code. So on line 67 here with our fin. Um, right. So do you I'm, ever intend to allow fin there and just return an object, for example? So, uh, so, so okay, so, that, so this is a great example. Um, what I would say is that uh, uh, lines, um, uh, Line 64 through 68 uh, should already cause a static rejection. Okay. That the obj appearing with it as a captured variable within a closure is already not an unal a statically unaliased reference. Okay. So that's specifically for the case of an object, but the case of a regular closed over variable where we just assign the binding and we're not saying some property equals this, then that would be allowed as before. Right, because, because there's, there's nothing, the, the, the only thing that these aliasing rules are prohibiting is property assignment notation. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Rust because the the Rust compiler does that optimization, I'm pretty sure. Cool. Okay, so uh, regardless of the merits of insulate or not, um, we still need something to reject spin. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, if we want to, um, you know, if we want the original Jesse goals, which I think I do want, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, the, the, the semantics that you're proposing here where you allow fin, uh, but, and the insulates provide a read only view um, are interesting. Uh, I, I certainly am not, you know, don't want to, to 
reject it within the first two hours of ever having heard about it. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, and, and there's nothing saying like, um, I did have, so one of my goals is definitely defense in depth here, where we provide various tools to people that are straightforward and do predictable things. And then they can pick and choose what they want for their programs. Uh, and then the question is, what, what are our requirements of Jesse so that people can have one understanding when they look at just the code? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's within the first two hours for everyone here, but Michael, but I, I am interested in other reactions to this issue of um, what, you know, with, with Jesse really trying to be a very small language whose purpose is to enable reasoning about programs with more confidence, with fewer hazards, uh, what people sense is about how restrictive property assignment should be. I think this has a place in that context. And the question for me really does come down to what, what kind of static reasoning is possible. Uh, Dan, do you have your hand up? Uh, I guess I can put it down now. <laughs> OK. Um, I was not uh, looking at that part of my screen earlier. So uh, if I ever ignore somebody's hand up, please just try to verbally interrupt or get my attention somehow. Yeah. Uh, part of my orientation about this um, comes from um, in, you know, in my E language, I had assignable variables and objects as closures um, and no records per se. The concept of a object as a, as a closure-like thing that did method dispatch um, uh, on method invocation. Uh, that was the primitive. It was not built out of uh, records of functions. The, 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 the object with method dispatch and invocation uh, was a primitive notion. Uh, and there was no, and there was therefore no sense of it being an, a, that the methods were properties where the properties might change over time. Uh, so all of the mutability was through um, either assignments to variables or through uh, primitive mutable objects like maps. Um, uh, and uh, the reason why I, so, so as far as sort of enabling e-like programming, you wouldn't even allow things like line 48 in the first place. And the reason why I thought to allow it is that in JavaScript, there's one often writes initialization code before releasing an object, you know, within the equivalent of an object constructor of sort of incrementally putting the thing together before releasing it to potential clients. And um, so I wasn't trying to introduce the semantics of dynamic property assignment. I just sort of wanted to enable pleasant notational patterns that people are used to would not be problematic. Oh, I remember something here. Um, sorry. Uh, okay. The issue that I was dealing with in some of the code that was written in the PEG interpreter, for example, is a uh, object was a function. 
So we do sort of have that static single assignment, but it's harder to do without actually having a real function behind it. Uh, 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 uh. Right, right. If you want to function with properties, yeah. the only way, without introducing some helper functions, the only way to do that directly in JavaScript notation uh, is to use a property assignment of some sort. Um, uh, and the most natural way to do it is to just use the property assignment syntax. And under the static rules I had in mind, uh, that would be allowed and unthreatening. And that would actually be a case where the commented out code on line 48 is not equivalent because the triple dot does not uh, convey the call behavior from mm -hmm. object to the newly constructed object. Okay, that hurt my brain. Do that again, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll write another example. Okay. Can uh, I give you clarification on line 48? Is that all? I'm assuming that is not intended to carry over private state as well. Uh, in Jesse, uh, all the private state is just closed over private state. Uh, okay. and, and those would be in the functions that are the properties of obj, so those would all get preserved. Uh, I, I'm mostly asking this in regards to the presentation I gave a little while ago, I think it was in January, and what I asked Justin to start championing, which is generic private slots, not using classes. Ah. So not using new, which would be banned here. No, it would still be fine because uh, that's done by lexical scope and all of the functions captured, all of the functions that are conveyed from obj to obj prime would have been defined in that lexical scope and therefore uh, would still be able to manipulate that same private state. The private state would be preserved. Okay. Okay, now I understand why this hurts my head because there's no run property. <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly right. Is that the call behavior of a function is not itself in a property of the function. And the triple dot is only operating on properties. Yeah, I, I read everything as E code, and so it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> um, I think we've probably hitting a wall this ter in terms of what we can discuss right now, and maybe we should table stuff until another time. Um, is that acceptable? It sounds like it's acceptable. Nobody's objecting. <laughs> I, okay, uh, I lost all audio uh, after the previous last thing that I said. Uh, so I missed everything that might've been said after, after that. Uh, there was a bit of a gap and I suggested that we table the rest of this for another time. So okay. we can ruminate on it. Okay, good. Uh, let us talk about uh, uh, trusted types then. Yeah, so I really don't know where to begin though. So uh, if anybody else has, you know, any idea on how trusted types could actually 
um, affect um, you know all, all the plants that we have basically if they can be superseded by someone controlling trusted types um, that could potentially just um, void all the um, efforts that we're doing I guess I'm sorry can you, can you say that again yeah if, if somebody controls trusted types um, they have um, you know like they have more authority than any kind of um, layering that, that happens with SES. Can you give an example? What do you? Um, well, I mean, from, from my perspective, it's it, the, the proposal itself um, controls uh, what kind of code can be evaluated. Um, so, um, Okay, let me let me try to frame it. Just give me one sec. Um, so I, I think we talked about this in earlier meetings, but I'm just going to bring up the list of uh, things that trusted types can actually influence because um, obviously now I'm not going to get it, but so to my knowledge, though, trusted types are only an integrity feature, they don't actually. Uh, prevent bad behavior is there something else um well uh, i'm trying to get to that table where where it, it talked about all the sinks that basically um well um you can create a policy right and that policy allows you to uh, further create uh, safe content um, that can be evaluated. So you are kind of giving, um, like if, if we're going to be talking about um, uh, like SES and the browser, we're, we want to talk about how we're going to cause um, non-secure or, or, you know, code, code not blessed to actually execute. Um, and trusted types can be a method to do that. Uh, the other idea was to scrub all code in the service worker or to scrub all code um, manually to prevent uh, access to uh, resources that are not, um, you know, um, on the whitelist to be accessed by that particular page. Um, so, so, you know, I'm trying to find a balance between if, if we go the service worker route or if we go the manual scrubbing route, then we need to parse things um, or at least rely on, on ways to um, manipulate uh, or catch all imports and, and other kinds of um, um, statements that could actually load resources externally. Um, so with trusted types being that mechanism to an extent, um, I, I think it is important that we either weigh whether or not it's can, it can actually help us prevent loading things, um, um, you know, a, a, as the one mechanism uh, to control things being loaded. Um, and if that is not, a, you know, something that it can deliver, then at least to find a way to attenuate it um, so that um, people using it um, you know, don't don't end up introducing loopholes. I don't know if it made any sense. Uh, walking through an example is always, I find the the best way to clarify. Uh, you know, create, create a tiny example that illustrates the point. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a little premature from my end. Um, I'm, I was hoping maybe others had some more input on this. Um, and that's why I was like bringing it up for today. Uh, but if it's uh, too early, you know, to have um, that discussion, I think we can just table it. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't found anything that really affects my thoughts on things from trusted types. It looks like it's just an integrity feature to me, uh, similar to uh, CSPs, uh, different kinds of integrity features, but this time it's programmatic instead. All right, maybe I'm over generalizing what it can do. Um, and maybe that, that's why I see, uh, but are, are we certain it only applies programmatically or would it also apply on the, because here they're talking about IDL level. So, um, so I'm wondering if it actually affects, um, you know, constructing, um, you know, content uh, from templates or from other things, um, which doesn't necessarily, um, cause you to construct, you know, document.create element, document.append child, but rather you have um, strings that have scripts in them, and then those eventually uh, are appended to the DOM, which would call the, um, you know, the interface um, uh, sync or the setter of, of the actual uh, script element being constructed indirectly. Um, and then it will place SRC in there. Um, you see where I'm getting at? Like, it, it doesn't seem that it's an API for you to just control constructing, um, you know, imperatively constructing a script, but rather if a script is indirectly being constructed, um, that you would actually um, um, have control over what content goes into that stuff. Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, I just don't understand what's objectionable about it right now. Uh, we have the ability to generate strings already and send them to evaluators. This is somewhat similar in nature to that. Most evaluators currently also do dot two string anyway, so they could do something similar by making a semi opaque type that has a two string that does something similar in nature. So, so if we are going to, um, um, you know, if we are going to um, censor what content can actually be injected in the DOM, then we will have to hook into every single, um, um, you know, method on the HTML element prototype um, to sift through what content goes into whatever um, uh, part of the DOM before it goes in. Um, maybe trusted types would actually be a way to not have to do that, all that work manually because they would actually be doing it um, so that when you append content, um, it actually gets um, uh, censored at those things. So, that, so, there's, so, um, so that would be an example of trusted types as an opportunity for us. That, yeah, that's what I'm hoping, right? Okay, so there, so there's really there's two, two interesting questions here, which is, in what way do trusted types present an opportunity, so that our desires for secure programming can be made easier? For example, that we can create a confined iframe where we can give untrusted code direct access to DOM elements because we've turned on this, these trusted type controls to prevent injection of URLs or scripts. Uh, and then separately, there's the question of, uh, or you know, separately, it's not really orthogonal, but of trusted types as threats. To what degree might a system with trusted types impose some kind of constraint that screws up our security goals? And if I understand correctly, Bradley was, was asking uh, uh, if there was 
some reason to believe that there's a threat? Um, I, I, I think that uh, the way it, it, um, it appears that you could manipulate content going through a sink, um, then it could be um, when, when a particular, uh, let me find an example on this packet. Yeah, create script URL. Um, someone just um, changing a URL um, so that um, a module would be substituted with another module that uh, fulfills um, the same interface expected, uh, but actually um, you know, doesn't um, guard against uh, or actually um, does something that you, um, you know, exposes something that should not have been exposed by the original module. Uh, I didn't, uh, can you give an example? Yeah, if, if there is a, like a, a simple module that exports a function, it's, it's meant to be a one-way function, for instance, yeah. and you call that function and stuff goes in, um, and normally it wouldn't, it wouldn't leak elsewhere, but okay. then because they, um, they catch the script URL, they di divert it to another module that basically replaces that function with console log. So, Mark, this is similar to what you did with attenuating the OS module for Node in your examples previously. Okay, so this would, so the, the, so the issue is where, where do you have to stand in order to do this kind of intervention? Uh, and uh, as long as, you know, you're the, it's only code that's legitimately in a controlling position over other code that gets to do this intervention in the, on the code that it's supposed to be controlling, then it's an asset. But if this intervention can be done on code that's not supposed to be able to be controlling, then it would be, then it would be enabling an attack. Uh, my, and I don't know the system well enough to be sure what category it's in, but my sense is it's more the first where it's an asset. That it, that it enables um, attenuation and virtualization by controlling code of legitimately controlled code. Yeah. Um, so, so definitely, I, I, like, I'm really interested in, in um, this being an asset as we move forward. Um, and if it can give us the kind of control we need to avoid having, um, you know, to actually do any code manipulation manually, that would be great. Uh, but worst case scenario, if, if that is not the case, then I think coming up with a um, um, detect whether or not trusted types is um, not, um, you know, superseded by other code, like other code has um, authority there, which it shouldn't. If there's a way to detect that trusted types are not being used, um, um, you know, maliciously, um, and then, um, you know, on bootstrap, um, and um, a basic configuration that would prevent it from being, um, you know, further utilized down the road, um, that would be like the minimal um, effort, I think, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, so in other words, the, the controlling code should be able to do things like in the box that we're seeing, but once it's created the environment uh, that the controlled code runs in, uh, it should not enable the controlled code to do likewise to other controlled code at the same level. That, and therefore, it should not provide uh, trusted types dot create policy itself uh, that should be considered a, a special power rather than just a powerless primordial because it it, it it's causing um, it's causing a state change that True. changes the the okay so okay. but, but only if only if uh, subsequent policies created um, do not actually um, um, inherit the restrictions of previous ones. You know what I mean? Like if, if creating a policy 
would um, result the second, the next policy to be attenuated in some way. Like, I don't know if it's um, a aggregate, like if it aggregates or if it's, you know, policies are independent. Um, these are all like, um, I think important questions that are coming up because of this, um, that, you know, like, I don't know the answers to them, um, but I, I think it's worth, um, you know, keeping an eye out on, or um, if someone, you know, is more familiar, I think, with, with, with that area, um, you know, it would really, um, I don't know, like maybe we, we can talk about it when, when it becomes more clear, I guess. Okay, it sounds like, I mean, the investigation you're doing right now of trying to create a CES frame or a Jesse frame sounds like the ideal context to explore exactly this issue. Um, that um, because it is, it is a browser specific issue. Um, uh, likewise, um, uh, I see we have uh, uh, two of the Salesforce guys here, uh, JD and Manuel. Um, uh, likewise, um, uh, I imagine that this issue comes up uh, for them. Do you enable? Do you enable the code, or do you plan to enable uh, the untrusted code that you load uh, into a SES compartment to have some virtualized form of trusted types not create policy? <laughs> Uh, J.D. or Manuel? Hi. Um, well, I don't want to, you know, misrepresent what the, the problems we're having uh, and how we're solving them. It would be ideally more of a, something I'd be more comfortable, uh, J.F., to answer. But let me uh, tell you that this, everything I've been hearing this meeting is, is very, very familiar to us. And uh, let me tell you one conclusion we're reaching in this very high level, but I, I hope it's going to maybe uh, answer a little bit your question. We are coming to the conclusion after trying a few approaches that we want to actually uh, go back or take uh, on the iframe uh, semantics for the way we want to you know, share code and data from one, what we call namespace to another, because in our, in our case, it's namespace, namespace to namespace security, what we want to achieve. And so uh, we were very granular earlier in our, in our earlier versions, like what we have today, and it's just very problematic. It gets convoluted and all that. But we found that the iframe semantics are maybe something we want to go back to. So at a high level then, when you want to share code from one main space to another, you import the code and the code runs in the names in the namespace where you did the import. And if you want to share data from one namespace to another, it's very much like sharing data from an iframe to an iframe. We are going to implement something similar to the post message semantics, meaning when you want to send something data out of your namespace, uh, you're going to have to like really clone it, right? It's not a reference. It's not something you can then pollute on the other side. So very high level, this is, these are my answers. I don't know if this is really useful, but uh, it's kind of the problems we're dealing with and that's how we are thinking of approaching them. And we're still in the middle of all this. It's okay. not like we have final results. Okay, unless, unless I'm misunderstanding, I think it's kind of orthogonal to the question I'm asking. Okay. With regard to... Uh, uh, just one of these units um, that's being loaded on top of a shim that's running on a browser and it's denying the code the full power that the code would have had if it was just running on a browser directly. Um, uh, so, you know, you're, you're, as I understand it, you're not even giving the code access to the real DOM of its real iframe, you're, you're intermediating that. Um, so in constraining the power, in, you know, in the shim, creating a virtualized environment for the untrusted code that it's loading, um, uh, what, 
uh, has there been any thinking about whether to, uh, to supply something that seems like the trusted types API? And if, there, if you are, you know, in the same way that you provide something that seems like the DOM API. And with the DOM API, you're doing essentially a complete membrane around the real DOM, um, uh, uh, which is a starting point for how you're attenuating the power of the real DOM. Um, uh, if you're trying to do this something like, like that with the trusted types API, how would you be attenuating the power of the real one? Did that make any sense? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I don't think I fully follow the, the question and you know, maybe I don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer for you. So let me, let me um, just with regard to the DOM, um, uh, when, you, when you're loading the untrusted code into one of these iframe-like units, um, you're still not giving the untrusted code direct access to DOM nodes. Is that correct? Sorry, could, could you repeat that? I was distracted with chat. Um, the, uh, so, uh, uh, so I'm asking about the, the, the Salesforce uh, sandbox, or, or, you know, the Salesforce security mechanism. Um, that, and I'm not concerned about the post message uh, between um, two different guests. I'm just concerned about how an individual guest is denied the full power of the browser that it's running. So you first load in some shim, which is basically your system. Um, uh, and then it has the full privileges of the browser that it's running on. Uh, and then it sets up an environment in which you load the untrusted guest and the untrusted guest is not given the full power of the browser frame that it's running in. Uh, in particular, the system has access to the, to the actual DOM nodes of the frame that it's running in, but the untrusted guest code is never given direct DOM access. It's only given emulated DOM access. Uh, is all of that is, am, is, does, is all of that, does that all of that so far correspond to, to, to um, your sense of what the Salesforce mechanism is doing? Yeah, this is, this is what the, that corresponds to what the Salesforce mechanism is doing today. And what I meant to say earlier is that we found after some time of doing it like that, that it's convoluted, problematic, leaky. And so it, and again, uh, this is my understanding, limited understanding from the time I'm being, I'm being at Salesforce, that we want to go to a newer version, and in in, we're calling a simplified version of our Locker product, where Locker, if, if you have code inside, I'm going to use these words, if you have code inside an iframe, and you trust that code to be imported and be run within your iframe, then it's going to have all the access to the, to the DOM of that iframe. We were, or we are currently doing, uh, you know, very, gran very granular uh, 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 limitation. Mm -hmm. So like, like what you said, right? That yeah, you import this code and this code cannot have access to my DOM and some of that. But again, it's been, it's been really, really problematic to work with. So we wanna simplify it and go more back to the basics. So I'm talking about the future and you're describing the present. Okay, so, um, so the, this future, uh, the what 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 the, in this future? How do you plan to handle untrusted code? Uh, again, my understanding is that you import untrusted. Code. Okay, we are talking about uh, 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 you know two way trust, right? Actually, that I'm, and I'm telling you just a very high, very unfinished uh, situation that we have today because we're still you know designing and work in progress but the idea is that if you import code you are pretty much giving a trust to to your dom so to speak if you're importing in an iframe but also the code that that if, if someone produces code and you want to that code to be allowed to be imported by others you're also telling who can import your own code so it's a it's a two-way trust that we are thinking of establishing and then there's very uh, 
you know, only within the box of the iframe, then you have the, the limitation, but you know, that the, the, the untrusted code, you know, once you import that, can access anything you have in your, in your DOM, in your iframe. Okay, um, could I, um, could I just um, uh, maybe just say, uh, like, uh, I, I talked with Michael Fig um, a couple of days ago about um, a service worker-less approach for Jesse Frame. Uh -huh. uh, and we basically talked about this um, um, kind of um, a membrane uh, concept, but I mean, DOM-wise, DOM we are compartmentalizing um, um, the DOM that uh, Jesse, uh, DOM, um, you know, DOM-bound um, uh, program would actually um, be allowed to access um, and we are saying that this is the compartmentalized DOM for that particular widget. We're just calling it a widget because um, it's a, a Jesse module that actually has a UI um, and, and that falls under widget. And the other categories um, that are um, without a UI um, are, are basically, um, you know, the other forms of, of, of extensions that you could import. Uh, by having that division of, of the code, uh, we, we are able to, um, you know, worry about, um, you know, instantiating the uh, DOM-based container for um, a widget um, by wiring the globals or the modules it can import. Um, and, and, you know, we, we worry about the containment at that level, but but in this model, a widget does not interact um, um, with with you know how the other other widgets come to be, um, although it might be able to indirectly communicate through one of the extension modules, um, you know that that are in between the two. Um, so for for SES. Uh, the thing is that you're importing a module and that module has to access the DOM. Um, and it's not necessarily a widget module because you know, that, that concept does not really exist. Uh, guys, um, uh, it is now uh, after three. And um, uh, in order to uh, uh, you know, keep with the precedent of adapting to uh, people's desire to schedule these meetings, um, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, adjourn. Um, but uh, you know, let's remember that we have some, some you know, open questions and issues here and, uh, to, be, to continue to be resumed, but uh, next meeting, the priority will be the um, uh, Patrick Sokel from uh, Modable uh, talking about the uh, safe module system that they've come up with uh, for SES. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.